The ancient reading is from the second chapter of Matthew. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem asking, Where is the child who has been born king of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened, and all Jerusalem with him. And calling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go, search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word so that I also may go and pay him homage. When they had heard the king, they set out, And there ahead of them went the star that they had seen at its rising, until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then, opening their treasure chests, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And, having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. Conscientious Objector by Edna St. Vincent Millay. I shall die, but that is all that I shall do for death. I hear him leading his horse out of the stall. I hear the clatter on the barn floor. He is in haste. He has business in Cuba, business in the Balkans, many calls to make this morning. But I will not hold the bridle while death clinches the girth. And he may mount by himself. I will not give him a leg up. Though he flick my shoulders with his whip, I will not tell him which way the fox ran. With his hoof on my breast, I will not tell him where the black boy hides in the swamp. I shall die, but that is all that I shall do for death. I am not on his payroll. I will not tell him the whereabouts of my friends, nor of my enemies either. And though he promise me much, I will not map him the route to any man's door. Am I a spy in the land of the living that I should deliver men to death? Brother, sister, the password and the plans of our city are safe with me. Never through me shall you be overcome. Next Sunday, we have our annual children's pageant, written and directed by Glenn. This year's pageant will be a side-by-side retelling of the nativity stories in Matthew and Luke, presented with a little Hamilton the Musical flair. Now, my sermon this morning deals with an aspect of the nativity story from Matthew, which we heard Kathy read a few minutes ago. And it's an aspect of the story that Glenn doesn't focus on next week. So what I'm basically saying to Glenn is that I'm not trying to steal his thunder with my sermon this week. It's worth noting, though, in both the Gospel of Matthew and the Gospel of Luke, the story of the birth of Jesus is located, is situated within a particular political context. In Luke, what causes Mary and Joseph to set out and travel towards Bethlehem is that the Roman emperor, Caesar Augustus, has called for a registration. And in Matthew, 
The political context is this awkward, fraught moment in foreign relations. Foreign dignitaries have arrived in Judea, gone to King Herod, and told him, we're here to meet a newborn child, a child who is the rightful king of this land and this people. For we've read the signs in the heavens, and those signs announce that your reign, Herod, is illegitimate. We want to meet the king. It's not you. I'm embellishing a little here. And Herod responds deviously, opportunistically. You know, I'd like to meet him too. Historically, we know Herod was a Jewish king who who ruled Judea for more than 30 years. During his reign, Judea was a part of the Roman Empire, so Herod ruled at the pleasure of the Roman Senate. If he didn't make Rome happy, then he could be removed. As king, he ruled with what, what, what we might call a conflict of interest. He was beholden not to his own people, but to a foreign power. Historians' opinions of Herod as king are polarized, though few deny that he was a tyrant and a brutal despot. His critics refer to him as a madman, an evil genius, and as someone who would do whatever it takes, no matter how immoral, to pursue his own limitless ambition. Herod was intolerant of dissent, He deployed secret police to spy on the people, he banned protests, and he used his power to persecute his opponents. Herod's personal life was deeply embroiled in scandal. Just one example, he plotted to murder and then later executed his first wife. And after his mother-in-law accused him of being mentally unstable and unfit to rule, he had her executed as well. Herod also had tax problems, especially regarding the misuse of the taxes he levied against his subjects. Historians who take a more positive view of his reign emphasize that Herod built a lot of impressive buildings. (laughs) This is true, by the way. you You can read between the lines here all you want. Construction in Judea was uniquely prolific during Herod's reign. He sponsored an enormous addition to and renovation of the Second Jewish Temple. He constructed a massive port on the Mediterranean coastline that was a true wonder of engineering. And he built several key military installations, including most famously the fortress at Masada. On the other hand, these projects were completed at the expense of impoverishing those he ruled through excessive taxation. And so in Matthew, wise men come from the east following the star. They're identified as magi. We might imagine them as Zoroastrian priests, learned scholars, astrologers. And though the text in Matthew is silent, Later tradition would embellish these descriptions with different branches of Christianity telling the story in different ways. There were three wise men, or twelve. They're given different names in different branches of Christianity. They're said to have all come from Persia, or from Persia, India, and Babylonia, or from Europe, Asia, and Africa, or even from China. They're imagined as sorcerers, as wizards, as kings. But in the gospel story, they come from the east, they visit Herod. With profound insecurity and devious cruelty, Herod enlists the wise men in reporting the identity of the child. The wise men journey to Bethlehem, visit the child, pay him homage, present him with gifts, and then they are warned in a dream not to return to Herod. So they disobey they disobey Herod and take a different route home. The text tells this part with one short sentence. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. But you can easily imagine all kinds of questions. 
What were the risks to disobeying Herod? Did the wise men put their own freedom on the line? Did they risk their own lives? Would there be diplomatic repercussions? When the wise men returned home, would their homelands be at greater risk of incurring the wrath of the Roman Empire and its armies? And what was the content of that dream, of that vision that came to the wise men and caused them to decide to return by a different road? Did the dream come to all of them or only to one of them? And perhaps most of all, how did they find the courage, the conscience, the conviction, the commitment to say, no, we're not going to do this. We will disobey. People who study life under authoritarian regimes write about what is necessary for people to resist and disobey. From her studies of authoritarianism, Sarah Kenzior offers the following advice for those facing the prospects of authoritarianism. She advises, write down what you value, what standards you hold for yourself and for others. Write about your dreams for the future and your hopes for your children. Write about the struggle of your ancestors and how the hardship they overcame shaped the person that you are today. Write your biography, write down your memories, write down a list of things you would never do. Write a list of things you would never believe. Never lose sight of who you are and what you value, and if you find yourself doing something that feels questionable or wrong, a few months or years from now, find that essay you wrote on who you are and read it. Ask if that version of yourself would have done the same thing, and if the answer is no, don't do it. So perhaps what gave those wise men, those magi, the strength and the courage to take that other road, to disobey, to not return to Herod, to not reveal the identity of the child born in Bethlehem, perhaps it was this strong moral compass. Perhaps they knew who they were and what they valued, what they could never do and what they could never believe. Perhaps it was as simple as them knowing this deeply. Another scholar of authoritarianism, Yale professor Tom Snyder, offers this advice about obedience. He says, do not obey in advance. Much of the power of authoritarianism is freely given. Individuals think ahead about what a more repressive government will want and then start to do it without being asked. If you find yourself doing this, stop. Anticipatory obedience teaches authorities what is possible and accelerates unfreedom. For Professor Snyder, disobedience is a conscious choice that we need to remember we have. And as I think about, <clears throat> as I think about the wise men, another source of strength and resilience comes to mind that may have been helpful to them in causing them to resist, to disobey. Remember, traditions tell us that the wise men came from Persia, India, and Babylon, or from Europe, Asia, and Africa. The wise men are often depicted as coming from different cultures, as having different skin tones, different religions. And maybe you'd think with, this, with these different ethnicities and different languages that one of them might cave one of them might falter. One of them might say, if I take the road Herod tells me to take, I could get on his good side. I could earn all his favor for myself. But that's not what happens. The three of them walk together. They take the other road together. Today we use the term solidarity. William Barber, pretty sure if William Barber met the three magi, he'd say, you're the beginning of a fusion movement. For a fusion movement to work, we can't sell one another out. We have to realize that our fates, our freedoms, our lives are tied together, that none of us can be free unless we are all free. Yesterday, I went to Raleigh for the Justice and Unity rally. I saw a few of you there. We had more than 1,000 people gathered in a park proclaiming our resistance to the KKK march that was happening over in one of the distant corners of our state. We're proclaiming our resistance to white supremacy, to bigotry and hate in all its forms. 
The speakers at this rally were mostly people of color, mostly young people. They included immigrants and Muslims and the LGBTQ family. It was inspiring. This gathering felt important. I'm convinced that I'm being called to show up, that we're, we're all being called to show up, only to show up in numbers 100 times as large, 1,000 times as large. But being there yesterday reminded me of the people to whom I am accountable, the people for whom I would disobey Herod, the people with whom I would disobey Herod. The Magi disobeyed by refusing to return to Herod. They took another road instead. But there is a way of disobedience that is beyond what even the Magi did. This is a form of disobedience described by Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the German pastor and theologian who was a major part of the Confessing Church resistance movement in Germany during the Third Reich. Listen to these words by Bonhoeffer. There are three possible ways in which the church can act toward the state. The first place, as it has been said, it can ask the state whether its actions are legitimate and in accordance with its character. It can throw the state back on its responsibilities. Second, it can aid the victims of state action. The church has an unconditional obligation to the victims of any ordering of society, even if they don't belong to the Christian community. Do good to all people. In both these courses of action, the church serves the free state in its free way. And at times when laws are changed, the church may in no way withdraw itself from these two tasks. The third possibility, however is not just to bandage the victims under the wheel, but to jam a spoke in the wheel itself. According to Bonhoeffer, disobedience can take the form of jamming a spoke in the wheel itself, of jamming a wrench in the machine, of pouring sand in the gears until they falter. Remember those words of Tom Snyder, much of the power of authoritarianism is freely given. Obedience, consent, going along are like oil lubricating the gears. Disobedience and dissent grinds those gears down. And so, like the wise men of the ancient story, like the wise ones through all history, let us pledge to disobey. Let us pledge that we will not hold the bridle while death clinches the girth. And death may mount by himself. We will not give him a leg up. Those ancient stories are powerful things. So may it be. Amen.